Hi there. My name is Yasmin, and I am a third year medical student from the University of Alberta. This video has been created with help from Dr. Simon Turner, a thoracic surgeon at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Edmonton. In this presentation, we will discuss mediastinal masses. Imagine that you've ordered a chest x-ray on a patient of yours with shortness of breath. When you look at the x-ray, the lungs look normal, but you notice, to your surprise, that the mediastinum looks quite abnormal. You speak with a radiologist who confirms your suspicions that your patient has a widened mediastinum and a probable mediastinal mass. What is the differential diagnosis of this x-ray finding and what should be done about it? Because mediastinal masses are not infrequently found incidentally on chest x-rays, every physician should have some basic knowledge about these lesions. After watching this video, you should be able to describe the anatomy of the mediastinum, list the differential diagnosis of mediastinal masses, describe the clinical presentation of an anterior mediastinal mass, and finally, develop an approach to workup and treatment of mediastinal masses. The mediastinum is the space in the center of the chest, located behind the sternum and in front of the spine and between the lungs on either side. The superior border is the thoracic outlet at the first rib, and the inferior border is the diaphragm. A great deal of anatomy is found in this limited space, and so the list of structures that can give rise to abnormalities in this region is long and varied. In order to help organize all of this anatomy, several systems have been proposed to divide the mediastinum into compartments. One of the most commonly used systems is the three compartment model, which divides the mediastinum into anterior, middle, and posterior compartments. The anterior mediastinum is located between the sternum and the anterior pericardium. The middle mediastinum is contained between the pericardium anteriorly and the anterior surface of the vertebrae posteriorly. The posterior mediastinum is located between the posterior pericardium and the spine, and also includes the paravertebral recesses. Another model that exists is the four-compartment model. In this model, an imaginary horizontal line drawn from the sternal angle of Louis to the bottom of the T4 vertebral body further separates the mediastinum, creating the superior mediastinal compartment above this line. However, for practical purposes, the differential diagnosis of masses in the superior compartment is very similar to that of the anterior compartment, so often the two compartments are considered together. For the rest of this video, I will be referring to the three-compartment model for simplicity. About half of all mediastinal masses are anterior, with the rest about evenly divided into the middle and posterior compartments. Normally. The anterior mediastinum does not contain many structures, mostly precardiac fat, lymphatic tissue, and the thymus gland or its remnant. Yet the majority of mediastinal masses are found in this compartment. One way to remember the differential of anterior mediastinal masses is the mnemonic, the four T's. The four T's are thymus, thyroid, teratoma, and terrible lymphoma. Each of the T's is a reminder of the kinds of pathology that can present as anterior mediastinal masses. Lesions of the thymus include benign and malignant thymoma, thymic carcinoma, and thymic cysts. Thyroid lesions in this region are most commonly benign thyroid goiters that have extended inferiorly from the neck, but thyroid cancers may also rarely be present. Teratomas are a type of germ cell tumor that feature all three layers of embryonic development, including the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, and these masses may produce hair, bone, cartilage, or even teeth. In addition to teratomas, any other type of germ cell tumor may be found in the anterior mediastinum, including seminomas and non-seminomatous germ cell tumors. Lastly, lymphomas are an important part of the differential, most commonly Hodgkin's lymphoma, though non-Hodgkin's varieties are frequently seen as well. 
Other less common anterior mediastinal masses are abnormally located parathyroid glands and pericardial cysts. Middle mediastinal masses are less common, occurring about half as often as anterior masses. More structures exist within the middle mediastinum, so the differential is not as straightforward. In general though, the major middle mediastinal structures can be broken down into the esophagus, the airway, and cardiovascular structures. Both benign and malignant esophageal disease can present as middle mediastinal masses, though usually not large enough to be detected on chest x-ray. Though not often thought of as a mass, esophageal hiatus hernias are quite common and can present as widening of the mediastinum and initially be confused for a mediastinal tumor. In the airway, bronchogenic cysts are the most common lesion, but benign and malignant neoplasms occur as well, including central bronchogenic carcinomas. Cardiovascular structures, especially aortic dissections or aneurysms, must be ruled out when investigating a middle mediastinal mass. Lastly, enlarged lymph nodes, either from benign reaction or granulomatous disease, or from malignant metastasis, are a common cause of middle mediastinal mass. The differential for posterior mediastinal masses is simpler. These masses are neurogenic tumors until proven otherwise. Among the neurogenic tumors, the site of origin can be broken down into nerve sheath, paraganglionic, and ganglionic. Each of these sites can be further broken down into a variety of benign and malignant tumors, but one that should always be kept in mind is an extraadrenal pheochromocytoma. Clinically, mediastinal masses can present asymptomatically or symptomatically. If symptoms are present, these can often be related to mass effect, and the patient can present with symptoms such as dyspnea, cough, substernal chest pain, strider, hoarseness, dysphagia, or fatigue. Patients with lymphoma can present with constitutional B symptoms, including fever, night sweats, and weight loss. Locally invasive mediastinal masses can present with superior vena cava syndrome. Lastly, it's important to be aware that approximately 30 to 50% of patients with thymoma will have myasthenia gravis. These patients can present with symptoms such as diplopia, ptosis, dysphagia, weakness, and fatigue. Because the differential diagnosis is so dependent on the location within the mediastinum, the initial test of choice in investigating a mediastinal mass is a CT scan of the chest. This will localize the lesion within a compartment and may give some idea about the characteristics of the mass that will help to narrow down the differential. Further testing depends on the compartment. For anterior mediastinal masses, it is important to look for the four T's. Thyroid goiters are usually easily identified on CT because they are contiguous with the thyroid in the neck. Thymomas may have paraneoplastic syndromes such as myasthenia gravis and often have a characteristic CT appearance. Germ cell tumors such as teratomas also have some characteristic CT features such as calcifications and it is also important to obtain blood work for tumor markers, namely alpha feta protein and beta HCG, as well as to perform testicular examination and scrotal ultrasound to rule out testicular involvement. Lymphoma, meanwhile, will often be suggested clinically by the presence of B symptoms, which are fevers, chills, weight loss, and night sweats, as well as the finding of lymphadenopathy elsewhere. In the middle mediastinum, tumors can often be identified based on their CT appearance, depending on which structure they can be seen to arise from. Finally, if a posterior mediastinal mass is found on CT, the next test of choice is an MRI, which can help to identify different neurogenic tumors and also rule out extension within the spinal canal. If non-invasive methods such as history, physical exam, blood tests, and radiology are insufficient to diagnose the lesion, as is often the case, biopsy may be necessary. This can be achieved in several ways, including 
CT guided core needle biopsy, endobronchial or endoesophageal ultrasound guided biopsy, cervical or anterior mediastinoscopy or thoracoscopy. The ultimate biopsy is complete surgical excision, and this is often necessary before a diagnosis can be made. A thorough discussion of the treatments for every different kind of mediastinal mass is beyond the scope of this video. However, it should be noted that treatment may range from surgical excision, as in the case of thymomas, thyroid goiters, and neurogenic tumors, to primary chemotherapy and or radiation, as in the case of some germ cell tumors and lymphomas. Some lesions may simply be observed, as in the case of benign lymphadenopathy or small asymptomatic pericardial cysts. In this video, we have reviewed mediastinal masses. The anatomy of the mediastinum was briefly discussed, and the three-compartment model of the mediastinum, with anterior, middle, and posterior compartments, was defined. Within each compartment, a unique differential diagnosis exists, which determines further workup and management. In particular, the 4T's mnemonic is an important one to keep in mind, as anterior mediastinal masses are the most common. To help with the differential diagnosis, the first and most important test is a CT of the chest, which will localize the lesion and give clues as to its origin, though history and physical examination, as well as blood tests, are also vital in establishing a diagnosis. Depending on the ultimate diagnosis, Treatment may be medical or surgical or simply observation.